Hi everyone. Today a video about some tarot books that I've been having some problems with. I think people who read tarot cards should also read books. You can spend the afternoon scrolling through Kickstarter. You can save up and buy that lovely tarot that you think you needed and you can believe that that will make you into a better tarot reader. But And it might do, but it probably won't. I'm also really excited today because this is not a short and so I've got more than 60 seconds to say what I want to say and that's refreshing. So I'm being a bit naughty here because I'm starting off with a, a hashtag from Katie Flowers, no disclaimers tarot, and she actually freely admits that she kind of nicked this hashtag from the no disclaimers book tag, which was from booktube, and it's about books that people have been having problems with. Now I, because I'm, I'm making a video about tarot books, I'm going to use both. And I'm going to go a bit off piste here. I'm not going to answer all the questions that I meant to answer. Probably not going to answer any of them. I just want to speak freely. Because it's fun, isn't it? Speaking freely. I'm going to start with a book that I find only mildly problematic. And I'm going to work myself up to a book that I think is the strangest book I've ever read. So we start off with the, the guidebook to the Intuity Creative Cards. Now, I'm a big fan of the Intuity deck. Um, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's, it's a brilliant example of Italian design, Italian creativity. The cards are very surprising. They're based loosely on the tarot deck, but very loosely based. And in fact, I think the creators started from there and then went off in a different direction, which is completely fascinating. I think you need the deck and you don't need the book. The book is sold separately. I find the, the book an absolute, it's what I call a brain fryer. It's extremely theoretical, level one, level two, level three. I suppose it's probably got some Kabbalah in there. Lots of talk about archetypes. It's got all sorts of little parables. It's got all sorts of little um, sample conversations. Now, this is a, the book that someone's going to love, but I find it incredibly confusing um, and incredibly um, over cerebral. Having said that, this is the sort of mindset, the sort of attitude that, that, that I really like with tarot. It's very modern. And some of the books that, that I don't like, some of the books from, from the old days, have a much less modern approach. I like it that this book is very much about problem solving, but I think basically it ties itself up in knots. So that's a semi thumbs down. That's a thumbs across for that one. OK, now um, I'm going to wade into dangerous territory, I suppose. Rachel Polak is, is the grand dame of tarot, I suppose. She's much loved and she's done a huge amount for tarot over the years. This 78 Degrees of Wisdom is a great classic. It's actually, it originally came out in two volumes and it's from, I think it's from 1983. I can't really get on with it. I'm not exactly complaining, but I, I'm interested as to why I can't get on with it. It's fairly well written. It has some interesting research in it. It's fairly in depth. And yet it, it represents a whole, um, what's the word? A whole world of tarot, a whole, a whole vision of tarot that I really feel I want to kind of leave behind. I think tarot is, is in a way a potentially extremely complex subject. You've got 78 cards and each card is a cluster of meanings and then they fall down onto the table and the, the possibilities of those combinations of those 78 cards are absolutely infinite. And my tendency in, in recent years has been to feel that actually I think tarot needs simplification rather than further complication. And when I encounter a book like this, I just don't feel enlightened when I read it. There's kind of like too much information. It's very abstract. It's sort of rhapsodic. It's very enthusiastic. It's very thoughtful. It's very much about personal growth. And I think all of those qualities are great. But how can I put it? A tarot card, especially a major arcana card, does really have two different functions. You know, it can be seen as, as some sort of archetype that you encounter on your road of personal growth. Or it can be used in a reading where it can be something entirely different. For example, um, you know, if, if, if the moon appears in the reading, does that mean 
you know, a major dark night of the soul? Or does it just mean that during your day to day, you're going to encounter some kind of test? If you get the devil, does that mean that you are wrestling with some terrible um, shadow issue and this wrestling is going to take you six months and, and, and ten workshops? Or does it purely mean that today you are going to be tempted to be, for example, selfish? And the more I read tarot cards, the less I use these huge archetypal meanings. The more I use tarot cards as a kind of system of, of hieroglyphics, an alphabet that can enable you to communicate with your spirit guides. And the more I, I leave um, this kind of writing behind, I will say no more. Similarly dangerous territory, another pillar of the tarot community, Mary Kay Greer, this time writing with Tom Little. And Mary Kay Greer is obviously a lovely lady. She's supportive and polite, and she's actually even answered one of my questions on Facebook, and she's helped me with my book. So respect and affection. But I do want to talk about this because I'm a tarotist and I'm a writer, and I, I have things that I want to say. Too much information, too much speculation. I, I bought this book, The Tarot Court, because I felt that the court cards were the one part of the tarot deck that I understood least well, having read tarot for like 35, 40 years. And I really wanted to get to grips with them. And I did a lot of reading about the court cards. And in the end, I formed my own ideas about the court cards, which are largely based on the research of Paul Hooson, who talks about traditional court card meanings. And in a very um, succinct way, gives you uh, digests and tables of the main meanings given to the tarot cards over the years. So you can, you can see what these cards meant over the centuries, and then you can really form your own opinion. Okay, so I have a number of beefs with this book. On the one hand, overall, too much information. It, it's very confusing. You actually drown in, in meanings. Um, the, the meanings just stack up for each of the cards. Pages and pages of meanings just for one court card. I finished the book feeling absolutely none the wiser as to what they meant. Also, um, the book really dives into some historical confusion about the court cards, which is um, the confusion around what the Golden Dawn did to the court cards, how the Golden Dawn um, reorganised the court cards or reimagined them, and the disagreements inside the Golden Dawn. So you've got the Rider Waite Smith elemental system for the court cards, and then you've got what you, I guess is the, the, the Crowley, the Thoth system. And these two systems can no way be reconciled. They are completely different. And I have to say that I, I, I read this book quite carefully. And by the end of it, I came to the conclusion that it is not always clear whether they are talking about Rider Waite Smith correspondences or Thoth correspondences. And there's a little bit of a wobble and it is um, extremely confusing. On top of all this, confusion and too much information. There are some pieces at the beginning where um, the authors suggest that the best thing you can do with court cards is really to decide for yourself what they mean, just to meditate on them, to find a deck that you relate to, to let that deck speak to you and to form your own meanings, write them down in your book, and then those are the meanings of the court cards. And that's a method that I just personally can't really see the point of, because I think that if we're reading tarot, we are to some extent communing with our ancestors. So I'm interested to know what these court cards meant to our ancestors. And there is quite a lot that you can find out. There's quite a lot that you can find out that people definitely thought about, for example, the Queen of Swords. In fact, 12 out of the 16 court cards have very um, specific um, mythological associations, which you can read about in Paul Hewson's books. And clearly, as modern people, the way we use tarot is a bit arbitrary, but I think it's a much richer source if you find some traditional meanings that you like and then, and then you work with them. I actually found some interesting um, research in this book about what Crowley had said, and, and that's what I wrote to Mary Kay Greer about, and, and that was really good, and that led me on to Crowley. So, you know, these are, these are good, serious people. I just, as a package, as a, as a thing, um, I, uh, the book did not work for me. Which brings us on to this bloody book, The Book of Thoth by Alistair Crowley. And I just want to say that you might like to give this book a miss. 
I know Crowley has his adherence, just that if you want to know about my personal taste, I think it's... These people of the Crowley generation were in a really interesting point in history and they were to some extent recreating or maybe even creating modern tarot. I think the Thoth deck is a needlessly confusing and complicated development. I'm also against this whole thing of high ceremonial magic. That's not why or how I read tarot cards. As I say, I read them as a, as a kind of like an alphabet so that I can communicate with um, whoever or whatever. I don't need to dress up and I don't need to spend days um, preparing rituals to get my mind, you know, absolutely attuned. I don't need to summon up demons or anything like that. And I think I find Crowley's mind extremely claustrophobic and I don't really want to spend time with it. I would say it's like one or two percent uh, interesting. And, and there are actually things that I've taken from this book for my practice, but it's a little bit like a needle in a haystack, quite frankly. I want to say something about generational attitudes towards tarot. So we had this thing of the these modern young Italian people with their intuity deck, which I thought was a bit unnecessarily complicated and uh, tying itself up in knots. But I find it very, very modern, and I find this I find this attitude towards tarot where one's saying this is basically a mind expansion practice, a problem solving practice. I find that very helpful. So we had these grand dames of tarot, Mary Kay Greer and and and. Rachel Pollack. And that, that's a certain kind of, of tarot world. And then we have more contemporary people, one of whom is a guy called Marcus Katz, who is here writing with Tally Goodwin and Secrets of uh, the Waite Smith Tarot. Now, Marcus Katz is an interesting figure in tarot. He's, he's, he's an empire builder. He, look, look, this, this thick book. It's a doorstop. And he, with various other people, he has published a lot of stuff. I respect him because he does original research. He goes to the British Museum. He reads letters that haven't been read for 100 years. He publishes the results. So when he says secrets of the Waitsmith Tarot, yes, kind of, that there is stuff in here that you probably won't find anywhere else because he's taken the trouble and Tally Goodwin has, has taken the trouble to find out. If you want to read a Marcus Katz book, I, I recommend a book called Tarosophy. What's really interesting about him is that he combines NLP techniques, which is a modern, again, mind sharpening technique with tarot. And although he is in some ways quite ceremonial, I think he identifies as a witch. So he does do some quite complicated things with tarot. Um, some quite ritualistic things with tarot. He's also quite into simple, quick, swift stuff. He's also into quickly imparting information, quickly telling you what he feels is important. And I'm really, I really admire that. So yes, Tarosophy is, is quite a good book. I don't think Marcus Katz is a brilliant writer and I find his books quite badly organised. And my, my objection to this book here is that although it contains good stuff, it's put together in, how can I put this? It feels like it needed an editor. For example, the authors just quote Edwardian writers such as A.E. Waite. They occasionally take a paragraph from an Edwardian book such as A.E. Waite's uh, Key to the Tarot and they, and they insert it into their book, which is at the beginning of a chapter which is absolutely fine. And then they forget to, to make clear that this is a quote. They don't put any quote marks around it. They don't put any notes on it. And it just is integrated into their text. So you could say they've just like cut and pasted A.E. Waite and popped it into their book. Um, I'm sure that's not the intention, but that's really how it comes across. And for that reason, I find this book confusing and difficult to get on with. OK, now things become really interesting because this is a book that I am sort of opposed to. It's A History of the Occult Tarot. It's by Ronald Decker and Michael Dummett. And this is an oft quoted book. I think they wrote another book about tarot, maybe something like A Wicked Pack of Cards. These guys occupy quite a large chunk of space in the tarot bookosphere because they're academics and they're really thorough and they write university quality books with huge quantities of learned notes at the back. It's all very well researched. I mean, it is 
how can I put it? It's an academic book, isn't it? It's got quite a it's got quite a nice cover. In fact, so far it's the best cover. Um, the other covers have been pretty dodgy. It's properly published by Duckworths and it's properly reviewed and it's very highly thought of, isn't it? So here it is, a history of the occult tarot. Um, my question is, why did they write it at all? Because they clearly don't like tarot. They are opposed to tarot, or rather more specifically, they are opposed to cartomancy. They're opposed to the idea of card reading. They are opposed to the idea of divination. They never really come out and say it, but it kind of drips off each page. So this book is, in a sense, written from the standard yawny, militant atheist point of view, which is so dominant in our culture today. And it, it is an attempt to put nails in the coffin, ladies and gentlemen, of the idea of cartomancy. And the way they go about this is to, to document all the ways in which tarotists have perpetrated fraud over the years. Um, for example, the Golden Dawn was founded on the strength of fraudulent documents. The Golden Dawn was, in a sense, a fraud. Fair enough. This or that tarotist, Madame Blavatsky, uh, they, they were charlatans. Um, they were people who were tricky. They were people who lied. And even, you know, as, as Decker and Dummett pointed out, they even, you know, cheated on their wives. They were that bad, as if that makes any difference to the subject of cartomancy. And again, the weird thing about this book, which is, which is very dense, it's written in an academic sort of Henry James, very, very thick, dense style. So sometimes you have to really fight to find the main verb in the sentence. You know, you, you wade your way through this book and as you're reading it, you're thinking, why, why did they read it? Is it just because they needed a job? There is no affection for the subject. There's absolutely not a single grain of humour in all 350 pages. But yeah, you know, I guess if, you're, if you believe in truth and you believe in history and so forth, which are good things to believe in, then presumably that's your reason for writing this book. Let's document all these silly superstitions and let's prove that this was a lie and that was a lie. For example, they're, they're very keen on the idea that the idea that the systems of tarot and astrology and Kabbalah are intrinsically linked, like in heaven, linked, you know, intrinsically correspond. They're very keen to prove that this is a fraudulent idea and that these correspondences between Tarot and Kabbalah are fraudulent. I don't care if they're fraudulent. I don't need these systems to be linked up. I think we can use these links if we want to. That's just me. Let's not worry about me at the moment. <laughs> but I don't care. What's interesting about this book, two things I want to say before putting this book in the, you know, in the bargain bin, is that as the book progresses, they get to the 20th century. And what happens in the 20th century? Well, philosophy kind of changes, thinking kind of changes, and you get people like C.G. Jung. And C.G. Jung gave a lecture called Synchronicity. I can't remember when he gave the lecture, but the lecture was published, I believe, as a book in the 1950s. So you've got these strands of thoughts coming up in the early and first half of the 20th century. And by the time you get to the 50s, then the idea of divination, the idea of synchronicity has become, to some extent, respectable. It is not just for, for freaks and charlatans and, and gypsies, gypsies, tramps and thieves. So the, 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 the sneering tone of the book becomes less sneering because the calibre of people who are now tarotists and who are now writing about tarot and developing tarot decks and so forth has gone up. And in that respect, the book is kind of interesting because they get to the end and they, they say, well, you know, we've proved our point. The story is finished. That's the truth. And now you know it. And then and this book's in the British Library and, and then we can retire. I don't think that's really true. I think it's rather ironic that Tara is more popular now than ever before. And I think that if you read the work, for example, of my favourite writer, Paul Hooson, which comes out a little bit, a couple of years after this, um, that redresses the balance. Paul Hooson's point is that, sure, tarot cards were not designed as an oracle, but then people have been using things that weren't designed as oracles 
for divination since the year dot. The Bible, for example, was always used for divination. Playing cards uh, were used for divination. And then tarot, which is a kind of deck of playing cards, was immediately used for divination as soon as it was invented. And I think as modern post-Jungian people, most of us would agree that it doesn't entirely matter if someone is a charlatan, because a charlatan is also capable of of channeling information. So there you have it, uh, Decker and Dummett, an absolute bete noir of mine. It was an extremely depressing experience to read this book. It just took up a lot of my time. And I'm glad I read it because, in a sense, I, I, I know the bad news. I know the worst of it. I'm glad I know that The Golden Dawn was founded on, on fraudulent documents because then if someone rushes up to me in the street and says, oh, you silly tarotist, didn't you know? Then I can say, yes. I did know, actually, yes. My last book is called Pamela Coleman Smith, Tarot Artist, The Pious Pixie by Dawn G. Robinson. And this was recommended to me by a friend. We all want to know about Pamela Coleman Smith. She's such a magical figure. We owe her so much. And wouldn't it be nice to read a biography about her, which, which told us something about her life? And, um, OK, so here we have a couple of hundred pages of text, and, and we have pictures, ladies and gentlemen, you know, so we're not complaining on a, on a pictures level. Very nice. And there is a little bit of, of research in this book, which you can glean um, as, as, as you wade your way through the book. I'm being a little bit dismissive. This is a difficult book to review because it's one of the strangest books I've ever read. It's written in an extremely strange prose style which is not clear. Even some of the spelling is extremely strange and I'm not being sarcastic. I got to about halfway through the book and I began to wonder if it had been written by chat GPT or some other form of uh, artificial intelligence because there's something profoundly puzzling about this book. The author says that uh, she moved to Cornwall and became interested in writing about the area. And in the course of writing about the area, she came across Pamela Coleman Smith as a legendary figure who had lived in, I think, her hometown, her new hometown of Bude. That's nice. Now, reading between the lines, it, it, it very much feels like this book is not written by somebody who came to Pamela Coleman Smith through the tarot because I think I'm quite fair in saying that the author of this book is not a tarot enthusiast, is not particularly well versed in tarot. There are some quite strange passages. For example, there's a passage which, which suggests that the author doesn't really know what a Marseille tarot is. Talking about the Tarot de Marseille, she says, Today on Amazon, a used set of these repro cards currently costs over a thousand pounds and a new set well over two thousand pounds. And I have to say, I just don't know what she's talking about. A used set of these repro cards currently costs over a thousand pounds. Well, you know, sometimes you go on Amazon and the prices have gone crazy because something's out of print and the price suddenly goes whoomph to a thousand. But frankly, you can get a Tarot de Marseille for like eight pounds new and, and a used one you can get free in the flea market. I got one free in the flea market the other day. And um, a, a new original unused Tarot de Marseille from, from the 17th century probably costs a million and is probably in the British Museum. So I don't know what that means, except that I, I, I think it means that the author is not really a practicing tarotist, doesn't spend time in, in, in tarot shops, doesn't spend time on tarot tube, is writing about Paola Coleman Smith as, as in a sense, a, a, a local oddity. I think that's not a terribly profitable way to look at Pamela Coleman Smith, as I will as I will explain. The book is written from a committedly feminist point of view. There is quite a lot on every page about the injustices of patriarchal Edwardian England and how women suffered at the hands of this very patriarchal society, particularly women who didn't want to get married, particularly women who wanted to do something else with their lives, like be artists, like Pamela Coleman Smith. Now, I'm not criticising this book for being feminist. In fact, I don't think it's feminist enough because it seems that, how can I put this? The unfortunate thing is that the author ends up painting a picture of Pamela as a sort of loser, 
as a sort of imposter, as someone who wormed her way into society parties and, and dressed up in turbans and gave her recitals of Jamaican folk stories and, and was basically a bit of a charlatan, in fact. And now I'm into charlatans, I'm into performance, I'm into wearing turbans and funny headpieces. So I'm all for that. But the author's strangely critical of Pamela. There's a whole chapter where she discusses, was Pamela really synesthetic? Or was she just pretending? And I find that quite strange and quite aggressive. Uh, and, and she comes to the, the conclusion that Pamela was just pretending to be synesthetic. You know, that she pretended that she heard colours and, and saw music. I think artists, you know, and synesthesia was a new idea in Pamela's day. And if Pamela wanted to get a piece of the action, if she was a bit synesthetic, but not very, why not talk about it? Why not put it in her press release? And I think if one knew more about tarot, one would be aware of the immense stature of Pamela Coleman Smith. I mean, I mean, I went online the other day and I looked up how many copies has the Rider Waite Smith tarot shifted and how many albums have the Beatles shifted. Sure, the Beatles have shifted more, but She's a comparable cultural figure. She's a massive cultural figure. She is a world-changing figure. She's not some mousy victim who ended her days in poverty in a small Cornish town. It's a question of emphasis, and I think the emphasis is all wrong. I think that there is strangely no feeling that, this, that the writer has any sort of affection or intuitive grasp of her subject. It's just a very, very strange and, and frustrating book, and it's very, very difficult to read. So, um, not recommended. I shall stagger huh, to Watkins Books when I'm next in London and get hold of that great, big, heavy, uh, luxurious uh, Pamela Common Smith book that costs 50 quid or whatever, and I'll stagger back to Berlin with it in my suitcase, and hopefully that'll be more fun. So those are my disrecommendations. Thank you for listening. And isn't it fun to talk for more than 60 seconds from time to time? If you agree or disagree with me, as I'm sure you probably will, there's a lovely comment section below just for you. Meanwhile, I would love my Tarot channel to get to more people, so consider liking it just to show the algorithm that you liked it. Or not, if you didn't and consider subscribing, and then uh, I feel better. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day. Read well. Bye. Oh, yeah. If you've enjoyed this video, you might like to consider subscribing to my channel. It makes a difference. Thank you.